The dispatcher was perplexed because little Lucy's voice wavered as she ordered pizza over the phone. But the terrifying truth hiding beneath her apparently ordinary home was uncovered when the cops came at her doorstep, shocking them. For a long time, they would be troubled by what they found. Make sure to hit the notification bell to remain updated on upcoming tales, and don't forget to engage by loving this material and subscribing if you haven't already. Then we can dive into the story. Chris remarked to his wife Marcy, you look beautiful, as he watched her gracefully descend the stairs. Date nights are rare for the couple, as their last one was more than three years ago. So, they were looking forward to their first one after Lucy was born, when they could relax with a bottle of wine and some tasty dinner. Confidently leaving the house for a romantic meal, the couple left their daughter with Adriana, who would be watching her for the entire evening. They had no idea that the evening would end in tragedy. Adriana and Lucy watched a movie, ate snacks, and played games before they left. As long as Adriana was around, Lucy didn't mind being alone, she found solace in her company and cherished her. Adriana immediately put Lucy at ease and fostered a sense of contentment and security in her. Adriana said it was time for bed once the movie ended, even though Lucy begged her to stay up a while later. Lucy reluctantly agreed, and they started to wash her teeth when the doorbell rang. Adriana left Lucy to finish brushing her teeth as her parents had asked, but she returned quickly, assuring Lucy that she would. Sarah, the dispatcher, asked, 911, what's your emergency, when the phone rang at the 911 call center, which seemed to happen in an instant. In a hushed tone, a little girl's voice said, I want a pizza, please. This startled her. Sarah was fooled into thinking it was a joke at first, but the girl's repeated plea made Sarah take the call seriously. She said, what's your name? Lucy, would you like me to order a pizza? The girl asked. Sarah asked if Lucy's parents were present, her confusion evident. Sarah understood that Lucy was ordering pizza as a signal for assistance after she asked some clarifying questions. In an instant, Sarah dialed 911, gave them Lucy's whereabouts, and begged them to come quickly. The cops saw that the lights were left on when they got to the house. As soon as he arrived at the front door, Daniel noticed that it was slightly ajar. They cautiously made their way inside, weapons ready. Even though nobody seemed to be home, there were obvious indications of recent activity. As they divided up, Daniel went upstairs to search the upper floor. He looked everywhere, but nobody was there. He asked, are you sure this is the right address, as he hopped down. Sure thing, his co-worker confirmed. It seems we're too late. Outside, a man lay unmoving in the bushes, as illuminated by Daniel's flashlight. Hurriedly making his way there, he saw Adriana still. As Adriana came to, her recollection hazy, medical aid was rushed to her. Her mind was jumbled with memories of a noise, an abrupt terror, and then disorientation. There were hints of a violent altercation when the police probed more. Adriana mumbled something about a house invader as she tried to make sense of what had happened in the ambulance. The police listened intently, anticipating some sort of breakthrough. Because her recollections were so jumbled, she had more questions than answers. Marcy was back at the eatery when her phone rang. She caught sight of an unidentified number while scanning the screen. Officer Daniel's voice, which was calm and sympathetic, asked, hello, when she answered. Mrs. Grayson, something happened at your house. The focus is on Lucy. With a sudden jolt, Marcy felt her heart drop, her world spin, and her fork clatter on the plate. Stepping outside, Officer Daniel surveyed the neighborhood. In their pursuit of surveillance footage, he and his colleagues started pounding on doors. Concerned and willing to provide a hand, neighbors shared surveillance footage, providing a fresh viewpoint and the possibility to detect suspicious activity. With the hope of catching a sight of the abductor, the officers hurriedly gathered the footage. 
Experts slouched over computers in the forensics lab of the police, poring over the material. After comparing fingerprints to databases, no immediate matches were discovered. There was a jigsaw puzzle of evidence that needed to be put together. A suspect profile started to take shape as they worked, which is still incomplete but is an important development in the case. Upon returning to the residence, the investigative team made an intriguing discovery, a unique footprint, separate from all the others. In order to narrow down the pool of possible suspects, police started comparing it with shoe databases. People were desperate to do everything they could to help get Lucy home, and the community as a whole was abuzz with posts and shares about her on social media. A discovery came to light in the hushed forensics lab, a fingerprint extracted from the ransom note corresponded to a record in the criminal database. With great attention, Detective Miller examined the match. This lead was absolutely crucial for them. Confirmation of the suspect's identity rekindled hope that had been waning due to previous disappointments and losses. With a commanding and authoritative tone, Detective Miller ordered the police to take immediate action. Teams dispersed over the city, ready to respond. A mad dash to apprehend the abductor had begun. They battled against time as they searched streets, lanes, and abandoned buildings. Then, a tip about a possible sighting or location was relayed to Detective Miller. A tightening net was apparent. The coordinates were communicated, and a SWAT squad was sent out without delay. The atmosphere was electric as they closed in on the spot. Careful planning went into a rescue effort, striking a balance between accuracy and time constraints. The breach started with a silent signal in a small, dimly lit room, and rooms were quickly evacuated as doors were forced unlocked. Despite her fear, Lucy was found uninjured. As soon as she was seen, the whole team felt a surge of relief, the terror had ended, Lucy was safe. The expression on Lucy's face changed from relief to excitement as she laid eyes with her parents. A family reunited after confronting their worst fears, it was an emotionally charged scene. They could finally hold their darling girl again after the horror. The delicate process of mending began for the Grayson family in the days after Lucy's return. The psychological and emotional toll of the incident was too much, so they sought therapy. A celebration was staged in the town square to commemorate the volunteers, police, and everyone else who had helped to Lucy's rescue. The community's role was truly astounding. Following the incident, the Graysons and their neighbors thought about how crucial it is to be cautious and watchful. With the arrival of trial day came a sense of closure. The weight of justice fell on the kidnapper, who is currently in detention. As the identity and motivations of the kidnapper were revealed, tensions rose in the courtroom. A man whose life had been a jumble of detours and lost chances, he had a rough past. The kidnapper's financial struggles were brought to light during the trial, which depicted a man trapped by his circumstances. His rising debt, debts, and lack of regular employment were all highlighted. There was a palpable sense of gravity in the courtroom as the gavel sounded to open the kidnapper's trial, a watershed moment for the Graysons. This was the last chance they had for justice, the pinnacle of their suffering. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief when the judge handed down the punishment. At last, the kidnapper would have to live with the repercussions of his crimes, and at least some of those impacted could finally rest easy. The Grayson family hoped for a fresh start following the trial. Although the horrors they had suffered will remain a part of their narrative, they were not defined by it. Together, with the help of their community, they were able to overcome the challenges they faced. A family bound not only by blood but also by the indomitable human spirit, they took a closer look at life with each passing day. That's all about the first story and now let's watch another similar story. A brave woman used a cunning disguise to free her kidnapped son. Whether you tend to be overprotective or laid back, offer your support by liking this video. Strength is a quality that every mother possesses. 
Given the various worries that come with becoming a mother, this quality is crucial for anyone stepping into the role. Every parent's worst dreams include kidnapping, along with bullying, disease, and countless other fears. This nightmare came true for mom Kali Atiyah, but she refused to give in to hopelessness and instead acted decisively. With an iron will, Kali got on a plane and put on a convincing disguise so she could see her son again. Kali Atiyah had no intention of ending up on the side of the road in Egypt. Neither was meeting a man of Muhammad Atiyah's caliber. In 1999, Kali was working toward her master's degree in education and Muhammad was working at a restaurant in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, when their paths unexpectedly intersected. A year later, they were married, but Kali remembers their romance taking a turn for the unexpected when their son was born. Muhammad left Kali to handle single motherhood three months after she gave birth. Muhammad had married Kali for a visa, as Kali discovered upon their 2005 divorce, despite her best attempts to save the marriage. Regardless, Kali made an effort to keep an eye on their kid Nico. Muhammad told Kali in July 2011 that his mother wanted to meet Nico because she was critically sick. Kali was aware of her obligations even though she was living in Egypt. The sisters Kali and Maria set out for Egypt with Nico. When they arrived, Muhammad hailed a cab to pick them up. But then, as they continued along a lonely road, the vehicle started to sputter. Muhammad stopped his car and said he was having problems. Muhammad abruptly removed Kali and Maria from the car before disappearing down the road with Nico following. When Nico frantically hammered on the back window, pleading for her and his aunt, Kali remembers the heartbreaking moment clearly. Unfortunately, Kali and Maria had little choice but to pursue the cab until it vanished, leaving behind just the footprints of its tires. Kali tried to keep her cool while she and Maria were stranded in a strange nation. But she knew that Muhammad, who had been her husband, now had a very different role to play as Nico's abductor. Kali wasted no time contacting the proper authorities, but she quickly learned that the cops couldn't help. The 2011 Egyptian revolution added another layer of complexity, since it was thought by Kali to have impeded the search operations and perhaps impacted Atiyah's choice to kidnap Nico. Even though Kali knew this, she still hadn't found her son. Nothing was found after trying everything, even hiring private investigators. Some may find Callie's decision to take matters into her own hands unreasonable, but she faced rising desperation and made it anyway. To a mother, though, such behavior made perfect sense. Inspired by an unfathomable love that knew no boundaries, Callie set out on four journeys to Egypt in pursuit of Nico. Without Nico, Callie felt like she was dying on the inside, existing aimlessly despite the fact that everything seemed normal on the outside. The engagement of a single private investigator gave Callie a glimmer of hope after two years of dogged effort and emotional anguish. A breakthrough was eventually achieved because to Callie's doggedness and the investigator's skill, despite the financial burden, they were able to track Nico down to Alexandria, Egypt, which put Callie closer to seeing her kid again. Unable to resist, Callie threw caution to the wind and spent months disguised as an Egyptian woman, tailing her ex-husband and son around Alexandria. Alternating between wearing a burqa and a niqab, she aimed to shield her face from her ex while ensuring Nico's safety. Each encounter with Nico tested her resolve to adhere to her plan, the proximity to her son without the ability to embrace him weighed heavily on her. Despite the emotional turmoil, Callie understood the importance of patience, awaiting the opportune moment to act. On March 14, 2013, Callie seized her chance. Approaching Nico outside his school, shrouded in black, she uttered words he had longed to hear for two years, Nico, it's mommy. Come with me. Recognizing her eyes, unmistakably blue like his own, Nico didn't hesitate. Callie swiftly ushered him into a waiting rickshaw, transporting them to safety, albeit uncertain of what lay ahead. In the safety of a hideout for three weeks before their return home, 
Nico revealed his father's motives for the abduction, Muhammad Atiyah sought to convert him to Islam, viewing American society as corrupt. Atiyah's allegiance to the Muslim Brotherhood underscored his extremist beliefs. Despite being out of Atiyah's reach, Kali and Nico remained vigilant, guarding their whereabouts from those they didn't trust. With Muhammad Atiyah wanted for kidnapping a U.S. citizen and falsifying documents regarding Nico's citizenship, Kali yearns for normalcy after Nico's safe return. Nico's unwavering belief in his mother's determination to rescue him reflects the boundless love of a mother, even in the face of adversity. Roslyn McGinnis, on the other hand, envisioned a typical childhood in Springfield, Missouri. Despite her remarkable ambition, dreaming of a future as a veterinarian and violin instructor, Roslyn's innocence masked the tumultuous path that lay ahead. Henry Pia's meeting with her mother when she was 10 years old ended any hope of her having a normal life and all of her dreams. Henry Pia was a child predator, sexually abused Rosalind from that point on, and the McGuine family relocated to Wagoner, Oklahoma, away from their cherished friends and family. Rosalind never accepted Henry as a stepfather. What happened to Rosalind would stay with her forever. The marriage ceremony took place in a mobile chapel and was performed by Henry's son. The pair was then moved by Henry to a makeshift tent outside of Gore, Oklahoma. He wanted Rosalind to be alone and for the family to live in seclusion. Henry took her from school on January 31, 1997, marking the official end of their relationship. One thing I did know was that I was alone with this man, neither my mother nor my brothers were there. Just before Rosalind turned 13, her mother Gail distributed advertisements describing the missing girl and asking for help in finding her. Shortly after that, they stopped looking. At first, her family thought she was gone for good after her abduction. In particular, Henry tried to erase her unique individuality by making her wear spectacles and dyeing her red hair black. He also had them take on false identities, Stephanie was one and Billy Ira Sloop Jr. was the other. Rosalind has her first miscarriage when she is 13 years old. How somebody could be so nasty to a child, much less to an adult like me, is beyond my comprehension. Rosalind purportedly gave birth to her first child at the age of 15 after Henry transported her into Mexico. Rosalind kept having children one after the other even though she was poor and didn't have access to basic utilities like gas heat or running water. The allegations against Henry include escalating his violent conduct from beatings to shootings and a specific incident in which he amputated Rosalind's arm to the bone. Therefore, she had no choice except to subsist on nothing. She resorted to selling ice cream and begging on the street to make ends meet. Henry once severed Rosalind's arm all the way to the bone as a result of his increasingly aggressive conduct. She encountered Ian and Lisa during a really dark period in her life. The British-American couple first crossed paths with Rosalind and her children in the grocery store, where they became fast friends. They simply sought anyone to converse with because it was not something permissible, Lisa remarked regarding Rosalind and her children. Unfortunately, this fleeting hope for Rosalind did not endure. Always transient, Henry relocated the family to a more secluded area in the Oaxaca Mountains, once again isolating Rosalind from any familiar faces. Here, she couldn't even plead for financial assistance, they were all essentially trapped, and all seemed hopeless. However, unbeknownst to Henry, Rosalind maintained communication with Ian and Lisa, though they initially failed to grasp the severity of the situation. It wasn't until the couple visited Rosalind's new residence in 2016 that they witnessed the dire truth of her circumstances. Upon entering the dilapidated home, they were confronted with a distressing sight, three makeshift stalls instead of bedrooms, walls riddled with holes, and meager foam exercise mats serving as beds. Lisa described it as a scene of horror, Rosalind and her children were not merely enduring poverty but living in a state of hell. Lisa later deduced Henry's true age, 62, which led her to realize that if Rosalind's eldest child was 17, she must have been only 14 or 15 when she gave birth to him, 
an alarming revelation. Rosalind reached a breaking point while recovering from gallbladder surgery at home when Henry, in a belligerent state, demanded she perform household chores. It was then that Rosalind had a revelation, she knew she had to escape, fearing that staying would drive her to madness or worse, leaving her children with Henry. Seizing an opportunity when Henry was incapacitated, Rosalind fled with her children to Ian and Lisa's house. With the assistance of Ian, Lisa, and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, Rosalind eventually crossed the border into the U.S. legally. However, even after her escape, Rosalind remained haunted by the specter of Henry, experiencing nightly nightmares of his menacing presence. She understood that the only way to truly break free from his grasp was to share her story with the world and stand alongside other victims of abuse. On top of that, on June 13, 2019, she hoped that her story would lead to Henry's arrest and conviction. Henry was convicted of multiple offenses, including sexual relations with a juvenile and abduction. Rosalind showed her resiliency again throughout the trial by sharing her traumatic story with the public. Everyone is praising her courage, but she can only think about one thing, her independence. It's a miracle I'm still here today, she commented. A brighter future was what Rosalind hoped for. Marilyn realized that while she would never get her childhood back, she could do her best to hold on to the memories for her kids. Rushing out of the house with her children in tow, Rosalind mustered an incredible amount of fortitude. On a spring day in May 2015, when the couple's three small children were in school, Cheryl Treadway's boyfriend Ethan Nickerson swung a large knife at her, but she remained calm and collected. At the age of 26, Dickerson grabbed the knife and his long-term partner's phone. Because he had Cheryl so securely bound, she started to think about methods to get out, she couldn't call the police and was shouting for help since she didn't have her cell phone. She offered to bring up her kids from school, appealing to Ethan's sense of fatherhood, since she knew she would probably not get the results she wanted. Ethan reluctantly consented, but he was certain that she needed him to accompany her to the primary school to collect the kids. Even though their father had just threatened their mother with a knife, the kids in the backseat probably didn't hear a word as they rode home in silence. When Cheryl got back to her house, she discovered that her predicament had worsened even more than before. Here, let's go get something to eat for them. Since the kids were ravenous, Ethan agreed that pizza would do the trick, though he did hesitate for a second, maybe because he felt a knot in his own gut. He finally gave up and let Cheryl use her phone, but only to place pizza orders through the Pizza Hut app. Even though Cheryl got her phone back, she was too aroused to call the police, if he looked into her call logs or picked up on her voice, she might end up speaking gibberish. She had to get creative by finding out if the pizza had been ordered through the Pizza Hut phone app. Adding extra instructions to her order for a big pepperoni pizza, Cheryl made use of the comment section. Adding a request for assistance, she wrote, please help get 911 to me in the comments area. When you need hostage assistance, dial 911. Closing her eyes and waiting nervously, Cheryl felt powerless after placing her order. As Cheryl's message grew frantic, the local Pizza Hut staff huddled around the computer, attending to app and online orders. The 28-year-old restaurant manager, Candy Hamilton, has never faced anything like that before. Uncertain as to whether Pizza Hut had received her message, Cheryl waited nervously by the window at home. She must have been terrified that they wouldn't take her seriously. But because Cheryl gave so many requests, everyone knew her name and took her request seriously. We didn't even question it, Candy Hamilton commented. We immediately called 911. After receiving the call, Lt. Curtis Leden and his officers from the Highlands County Sheriff's Office went to Cheryl's house. Feeling a surge of relief as they pulled up and parked their vehicles, Cheryl knew she had to move swiftly to protect her three children before Ethan realized the cops were there. Curiously clutching her youngest child, Cheryl fearlessly dashed towards the authorities, relaying the situation inside the house to Lt. Leden. 
At the time, Cheryl had no idea how lucky she was with her timing. Because of his position as crisis team lead negotiator, Lt. Le then expertly persuaded Ethan to surrender without endangering anyone else. With the help of the deputies, Cheryl and her children were able to reach safety. Lt. Le then admired Cheryl's innate intelligence and rapid thinking, admitting that he could not have come up with the same strategy on his own. The manager of Pizza Hut, Candy, was quick to hail Cheryl as the situation's savior and applaud her creative problem-solving. In Candy's opinion, it was absolutely incredible. Incredibly, pizza saved another life.